Tonight, we're talking about four score and seven years ago, something like that, about a great divide that splits this country. It's called politics. And it is the most serious issue of our time, maybe the most serious election in the history of this country. For those who are foreigners, it is not typical, but it is also part of a ongoing political divide that exists in this country really since our founding and pronounced in many ways during the Civil War and the same issues are creating a great divide. And now we have more information, more media, more opportunities to look at who our candidates are, but we may not have any more realistic understanding of the process or who or what they are. So given that media, given visual media is so prominent in all of this, Michael has chosen to parse it with us. And I'm not going to say more. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, it's good to see you, a lot of you again. Uh, I'm going to go through a little summary of our site. So it's going to be much shorter than yesterday, but uh, just bear with me if you were here before. Um, I'm Michael Shaw, publisher of the nonprofit visual and media literacy site, Reading the Pictures. L launched in 2004, we analyze uh, news and documentary photography on a daily basis. We're the only site that does that. We are closely followed by the news and visual media, the photojournalism community, university journalism, photojournalism, and communication programs, and citizens interested in politics and visual culture. And you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube, and on our own site, readingthepictures.org. To give you a brief overview of what we do, we look at how traditional media and social media frame major visual news stories and what kinds of information and messaging those images convey. We look at how news photography is changing, becoming more prominent. Someone recognized the picture, right? Uh, become more prominent, powerful, and controversial, especially in the way it inter interacts with social media. And uh, for those of you who don't recognize the picture, this was a portrait uh, an airline passenger took uh, earlier this year with a hijacker. We examine the extent to which news photos are delivering news and information versus sensationalism and spectacle. That's um, a favela in the foreground and the Rio's Olympic Stadium behind. We look at the representation of race, class, gender, age, and other social concerns. And that's a con confrontation on a French beach over a burkini. We look at aesthetics, particularly how news photography has been borrowing from art and documentary photography, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. And this artful award-winning photo from 2010 shot for GQ shows the water surface after the BP oil rig explosion in the Gulf of Mexico. Informative or just pretty? We look at the overlap between news photography and political communications, or what used to be called propaganda. We look at the overlap between news and PR and the pervasiveness of personality, politics, and cultural celebrity. We examine how and how much people have become public brands and the extent to which public identity and public roles have been overshadowed by political and cultural celebrity. And this is Sean Penn during a self-assigned interview for Rolling Stone with the drug lord Chapo Guzman. We address ethics and best practices and also do some photo forensics and investigative analysis. We've uncovered misrepresentation in a major photo contest and the staging of photographs in war zones. We also host the Reading the Pictures Salon, where we engage professional editors and photographers from the photo world, as well as edu visual educators to analyze visual coverage of the top stories of the day. An exciting exercise in media and visual literacy, these participants analyze a select edit of nine to 10 individual images online in a live Google Hangout with accompanying audience chat. And by the way, you might notice that's our old name. We changed our name this year, so you might see that bag news or bag news notes on a couple of different slides. Don't panic. 
but we're here today to talk about the election. We all know something radical has happened in the course of this presidential cycle. With each passing year, political gridlock and polarization has left the public feeling increasingly marginalized, frustrated, ambivalent, and angry. Consequently, what we've seen from the beginning is a backlash to business as usual, targeting the posturing, the rituals, the coronations. I think it's also a reason why selfies have played such a prominent visual role in this cycle. I think it's a way citizens could at least <laughs> it's a way citizens could at least imagine some sense of power and control. From early on in the campaign, contract photographers and freelancers, especially on Twitter and Instagram, have been challenging the campaign process and its rituals. Yes, we have seen this kind of satire and irony before. We saw it in large doses in 2012 and 2008. But we've also seen a lot more images this year pulling back the curtain and pictures that in other years, I'm convinced, would not have ever seen the light of day. In my mind, this refusing to take the campaign at face value comes from a more de democratic and populist posture. If you think Mark Twain or Will Rogers it's a wry defense of the American instinct. Complicating the issue, though, what we also encountered and are continue to encounter are candidates hoping to capitalize on that alienation by acting more angry, more crass, more outside the system, and more upset with the status quo. Consequently, I think we've gotten a confusing picture. By mimicking the public's frustration and anger, the candidates made it difficult, if impossible, to visualize the larger mood on its own. Instead, the photography, like a body fighting a virus, seemed to overwhelmingly target and chip away at the artificia artificiality and those that would exploit the mood. That's what we see here, by the way, in this photo by Stephen Crowley. Our tagline for the painterly photo was, Old Glory in the Underworld. To better appreciate these dynamics, I'd like to step you chronologically through photos from the past year and a half up through the early primaries, then jump to the conventions, then I'd like to focus on some photos that get outside the anger, the negation, and the preoccupation with inauthenticity to articulate a more thoughtful and affirming sense of this uniquely American exercise. So let's go back. Let's go back almost exactly two years ago, September 30th, 2014. I saw this as the first Campaign 16 photo op. It's a Clinton tweet celebrating the birth of their granddaughter. Setting the stage for the Clinton candidate and uh, the Clinton candidate persona, we see the wife, the mother, the grandmother, this framing of a happy marriage. Well, little did they know what this election had in store, for warm and fuzzy. This is 16 months later. It's March 2015. We see Ted Cruz at Liberty University w doing a walkthrough before announcing his candidacy. And it's all about theater and drama and creating an aura. But again, it's also about using family as props and pulling back the curtain to expose the staging. So let's jump three weeks. It's April 14th. This is Hillary Clinton. She's just launched her campaign. This is the first public photo op. Now, this was taken, though, by Barbara Kinney, her official campaign photographer. So this is from the campaign. It's in an Iowa coffee house, and these pictures just couldn't look more stiff and more stagey. <laughs> they, they were clearly not picking up the mood in the electorate whatsoever. OK, <laughs> same week. Saturday Night Live profiles the campaign launch. Different tone. Kate McKinnon as Hillary is trying to make a cell phone video for the American people, and she can't do it. She's feeling too much hostility, too much entitlement. So the skit emphasizes the difference between the public face and the private face. And there's an attempt to break down the difference. It's going after that artificiality. Great. That's pretty standard for political parity in any year, right? But this year, it's edgier, and it's hitting a, a, the, a country, a population, uh, an electorate that's in a much testier mood. This is a month later in Iowa, May 19th, 2015. This photo was taken by Danny Wilcox Frazier, uh, posted on Instagram. 
and we're starting to see the backlash take shape. What's happening in real life is that reporters at this uh, press conference, rare Hillary Clinton press conference, um, is, are they're trying to get her attention. But Frazier crops it in such a way that it looks like finger pointing. The larger theme is how much candidates in the process are not just on the hot seat, but in the line of fire this year. And talking about line of fire, if you remember this photo, this is another month later, it's June 20, 2015. Talk about projecting hostility. This was taken at a pro-gun, pro-Second Amendment event at an Iowa shooting club. And now it's important to understand though that this Cruz event occurred just three days after the mass murder at the Charleston Church in South Carolina in which Dylan Roof was hoping to start a race war and killed nine people including the senior pastor. Back to the tone again. It's curious that this photo was ever approved for circulation. It certainly seems like it was channeling the campaign's harsher mood, certainly. Perhaps it was also punishing Cruz for, um, uh, for ignoring uh, or even exploiting the church shooting and the culture of violence. What happened next, by the way, is that right-wing sites led by Breitbart Media unleashed an online barrage against AP uh, just they were totally offended by the picture. Whether the result of second thoughts or intimidation, the Newswire apologized for the photo and stopped circulating it. This is three weeks later, and this photo was included in a, a July 4th New York Times feature on campaign selfies. It was taken by a lobbyist working in the Iowa State House named Maggie Fitzgerald, that's her, and she had plenty of access to presidential candidates because they basically live in Iowa for you know, a year before you know, the, the uh, caucus. But Fitzgerald's pictures were much different than the others in the Times piece. Um, the other selfies uh, that citizens took were more about um, simply scoring a trophy or a souvenir. Uh, given the, tr the humor, I'm not sure the editors really cared about the difference though and uh, how much Fitzgerald's pictures seemed to actually be laughing at versus with the candidates. And here's uh, one more example. Yeah. It's more salacious, uh, but at the same time, it's, uh, you can see why Trump's enjoying himself. It's totally playing to his MO. So this is three weeks later, July 7, 2015, and Time publishes what seemed like a rather innocent sounding slideshow titled, Photographing the Presidential Campaign with an iPhone 6, uh, it was, the pictures were by Brooks Craft, a very experienced campaign photographer, very smart photographer too. And um, we felt that this slideshow is where the backlash really started to crystallize, at least visually. If they had an informal cell phone vibe and the feel of informality, the pictures also reinforced this instinct to strip off the varnish. There was about 18 photos in the slideshow, I believe, and the first half of them are pretty jokey, sort of innocent, all whimsical, non-threatening. You had the Republican shoe in choice for the Republican nomination, Jed Bush, walk in front of a group of Hillary Clinton supporters at a um, Fourth of July parade. You had Christie walking down this path <laughs> in his Christie way, I guess. <laughs> you had Rick Perry taking a photo of a fellow candidate. And then we had this. So this is a Hillary event in Hanover on the 3rd, and here you start to see this disconnection, the distance, the skepticism. This, the others were light and jokey, and this is hard. And then there's this one, same event, and it's really interesting, the shot by, Cra uh, by Kraft. You know, it, it could say it's just an innocent photo. Here's somebody. Um, waiting for the event to start, they're having a piece of pie, there's a lot of sun, you know, you want to shield your face, et cetera, et cetera. At the same time, it also works on another level, which is sort of like, I don't know if I want to be identified with this process. You know, the whole thing about like, you know, uh, you know putting a bag over your head. So, this is another example and I, of a photo that I don't think would have been taken or at least not published, if not for the degree of political alienation this year. What we see uh, is um, 
a supporter, uh, she's wearing a, a Hillary uh, button or sticker. Uh, the supporter is sharing her thoughts or perhaps speaking her mind to uh, Yuma Abedin, Hillary's right-hand woman. They're divided by a wall. It's the aide who's on the outside and the citizen having to drop down to address the power. Even more telling and defiant on the photographer's part is how much Abedin seems to resent it. So it's a month later now and the debates are underway. It's August 2015. This shot was taken by Doug Mills for the New York Times. If you remember, the GOP primaries were split into two groups according to poll numbers, the top tier and what was literally called the undercard. So we're in Cleveland Arena, site of the Republican convention. The lower polling group is on stage. And it's a wonderful opportunity to come and listen to the issues, engage in civics. There's two sitting governors, a sitting senator on that, in that group, and a chance to frame and address the critical issues of the day. And what do you see? Hardly anybody shows up. I feel that Mills was out to punctuate that point and even shame us a little bit over it. Certainly, it's a powerful illustration, too, of the effects of racehorse journalism. Later in August now, this is August 24th, how many people, what, how, how many people have not seen this picture before? Hmm. Interesting, okay. Uh, at the time, this is six, month before, six months before the Iowa caucus, and Trump was riding the backlash like a rocket. And truly, he was the darling of the backlash. The media were flocking to him. They were glorifying his defiance, his bad boy stance. This is where he really banked those millions of dollars in free advertising and exposure. So here he is in his cluttered office as the faux statesman. And the media, especially Time and CNN, were clearly laughing, laughing with him and lavishing him with attention as he called BS on business as usual and was defying every rule in the book as a candidate. Well, what's telling to us is uh, the status of the eagle as a patriotic symbol. While Trump is feted for his madcap ways, the eagle by association is left to flail. Like the debasement of the bird, the portrait also, also showcases how much the campaign itself has come unglued from the flagpole. This is three weeks later. <laughs> <laughs> this is why like a super high resolution screen is like, you know, totally worth the investment. Um, we're in New Hampshire, September 3rd. The photo, along with about eight others, all appeared in a Reuters slideshow. And you know, what else do you say? They, were, they just tore Bush to pieces. You c I can't tell how much Trump's belittling of Bush is responsible or just hasten the demise of a candidate who wasn't, who was just terribly awkward and out of touch and maybe feeling entitled by his legacy. But it, it was just bad. Here's a picture of uh, Bush at the Iowa State Fair eating a pork chop, or, or, or maybe the pork chop's having him. Uh, here he is in New Hampshire, has his hands full with a group of daycare children, like, you know, good luck with Putin. Sad. So this is a month later, October 22nd. Uh, and Hillary Clinton is marching into the Capitol building, putting on really good, strong face. It's her second appearance before the House Benghazi Committee. Whether a witch hunt or a demand for accounting, uh, it's about how much baggage and distraction both candidates have brought into the process this year, only adding to the cynicism and frustration around the election. This draws the dysfunction in Washington right into the presidential campaign. We see the ranking Democratic member freezing out the Republican chairman to shake Clinton's hand. Okay, so November 12th, 2015, less than two months away from Iowa. It's like this thing goes on forever, right? This was taken by Jeff Jacobson uh, for time. In terms of the skepticism over campaign politics as usual, this photo literally takes the candidates apart. It's not a collage, but it looks like one. It was taken in New Hampshire, and we're looking down at a Mar Mar Marco Rubio brochure on a checkered tablecloth. More pointedly, the construction suggests an empty cup for a head and a used tea bag for a brain. One more time, we see the media feeling the li liberty and license this year to dismantle the show. Two weeks later, this is Landon Nordeman for time. 
As I mentioned yesterday, Landon is a fashion photographer, feels a lot of license to, you know, capture it the way he sees it. It's a picture of a Trump supporter at a rally in Sarasota. As Trump gains traction and people realize he's not going away, now he's clearly becoming, amongst his fans and his critics, the lightning rod for public disaffection. Capturing that love-hate and also the surreal quality of Trump's growing viability, Nordman's photo evunk, evokes Monk's famous painting, The Scream. Same rally, here Nordman, Nordman, uh, Nordman offers an unvarnished look at Trump's brass knuckles, the muscle behind the curtain. These are the guys who've been tossing out protesters and uh, reporters and, ru and roughing up others. And to me, one thing about the picture that's interesting is how much it takes the red, white, and blue motif, and now we're talking black and blue. And that little red hat, right? Let's skip another two weeks. This is December 3rd, a Getty image photo. So this was actually, th these, are, these are the things you never know unless you actually read captions as obsessively as we do. This was actually taken during the 2016 Republican Jewish Presidential Candidates Forum in Washington. <laughs> uh, the most important to make a point to make about this photo, though, is this is an easy picture to get. A, f a campaign photographer can take this picture any time they want. You know, it's like, glad you're here. Can we move to the next slide? Uh, you know, let's get started. Hold the applause. It's always there. So then. The question is, yes, it's a cheap shot, but why did it run just then, December 3rd, 2015? It seemed pretty clear, to me anyway, that the media and many in the public had reached a tipping point in the perception of Trump as a demagogue. This is a week later. <laughs> How many people saw these videos? They're going to be really happy over at time. That's a lot of hands. So, this is pretty interesting from a media perspective. Four months back, if you remember, Time published that viral eagle photo. And now, this is four months later, the person of the year issue. And they've got like a lot of eyeballs they want to capture at the end of the year. And when they took the other picture, they, kept, they did all kinds of video of Trump and the eagle in the guy's office. And so now they're releasing all these pictures of him being totally intimidated by the animal. With the growing criticism of Trump, now time's jumping on the bandwagon of riding him down, whereas before they profited by riding him up. So that's how, that's how it works. It's January 4th, 2016. How many, how many people have seen this one? Okay, I was now less than a month away. And you couldn't get a better expression of Trump's outside, outsized effect and the screaming gap between his attraction and repulsion. So the question is, is this citizen in Massachusetts, is she awestruck or is she horrified? Oh my gosh, I'm this close. It's incredible. I can't believe it. So is it that or has she seen the poltergeist? <laughs> As you all know, Trump wasn't this year's only lightning rod. This is January 21, 2016. It's a little over a week before New Hampshire. And Sanders and Clinton have just finished in a virtual dead heat in Iowa. The photo of the signature ra uh, raised fist boils Sanders down to the essence as an icon of the backlash and frustration over the status quo. Still, given the Clinton brand, her organization, the support of major players, and as we learn later, the Democratic Party machine, Sanders' main challenge seems to be fighting the perception that he's simply a protest candidate. Still, no one, as we see in this photo from Iowa, published on the 28th, so catalyzed the young and the remnants of the Obama hope surge either. And a statistic I heard is that uh, Sanders got more votes than uh, Clinton and Trump combined during the primaries. OK, it's February 15th, 2016. We've now had two primaries. Trump rolled in North, uh, New Hampshire, and it's on to South Carolina. And talk about upending the status quo. This, uh, the, the Bush family is in like fire, uh, firewall mode. This is like their last ditch, it, ditch effort in South Carolina. They've brought in W, who's very popular there. And we see a very glaring example of the backlash. Trump 
that week felt free to do what no one in senior government or presidential politics, this goes back three election cycles, had dared to do at all. He spent the entire week repeatedly calling out Bush 43 for lying to invade Iraq, miring America in a decade of war, and, and consuming the country in patriotic theater. And you can see, again, such an unusual picture. Usually, you wouldn't see this, that, or the, it would be left on the, on the editing table, but there, Bush, uh, George and Laura are absolutely squirming, and, off, and nobody's offering any protection. Okay, this is February 26th. It's right after the Nevada uh, primary and right before Super Tuesday. And Trump demolished the field in South Carolina. He took all the delegates. This was taken by Nate Gowdy for time. And here we see a sign to a party at the Trump Hotel in Las Vegas to go upstairs and watch the latest GOP debate. The photo calls out Trump from a moral standpoint, evoking his longstanding Playboy persona, insta instances of misogyny on the campaign trail, and allegations of seedy business ethics. There's a clear sense now by everyone that the election process has turned into a referendum on Trump, at least at this point. Lots of visual media and social media energy is now being directed at calling him out for his outrageousness. This was taken by Campaign 16 Visual Gadfly and MSNBC contributor Mark Peterson. And basically what he's doing is boiling Trump down to his most essential organ. This was published uh, March 15th on Instagram. It's Nate Gowdy again. And uh, this is one of my favorite photos. Uh, this is me wearing my clinical psychology hat as opposed to the picture reading side. And I think that this multiple, multiple exposure really captures Trump's key personality traits, which are hyperactivity and impulsivity. I'm going to show you a pair of photos. These were um, taken on March 30th, and with the ele general election now coming into view, starting to see like, how it's going to emerge, this, these t there's two photos in this, um, I think it's like a 12, 16 photo um, picture of the week slideshow that were presented back to back. This is the first one. I'll show you the other one in a second. And I should add, by the way, that they were taken by different photographers in different states on the same night. So there's this one, and then there's this one. It seems the photo editor in putting these two together was, was either picking up on or else exploiting the public disaffection and the high negatives for both candidates. And that tendency many people feel that politicians or well-heeled aspiring ones are all the same. And then, I love this. You don't see illuminating photos of Hillary Clinton hardly at all. Uh, and this, uh, I think, is a great take on her character. It's in a deli in, uh, in Brooklyn before the, right here, uh, before the New York primary in April. And I call this Hillary Clinton's forced choice. It's forcing her to decide if she's more partial to strawberry or is she more partial to lemon. And so it's making light of the Clinton's reputation for triangulation, playing one side against the other, working both sides against the middle. Uh, and I wonder if she actually knows that, and that's why she's laughing, that she's sort of busted. But uh, also, you know, because she's so much this kind of cerebral, this wonky person, and we hear all the time that, no, she's got a great sense of humor. If you spent time with her, you would know she's like really a lot of fun. So, you know, maybe what this does is, in that rare instance, it captures her sense of humor also. This is the last picture I'll show you before I move to the conventions. It was also taken before the New York primary on Coney Island, still trailing Hillary. We found it articulated once again the callousness of the horse race. Our question was, is Sanders too often treated like an amusement? OK, so now it's convention time. We go to the RNC. And the contest for the general election is now set. But both parties have big challenges in their conventions because of the national mood and the, this disaffection with the status quo. And it's interesting how it became crystallized in different ways at both, in both instances. Uh, and it's also informed a, a lot of the photography, either in a skeptical or a critical way. With the RNC, there was this focus on homogeneity, almost all white, only 18 black delegates. 
we saw ongoing Trump resistance. And I really love this kind of Lucifer vibe that's uh, going on here because people <laughs> weren't very happy with, you know, <laughs> uh, Ted Cruz's play. Uh, and then, whereas the, we live in a complex world, and th this is an opportunity to like really flaunt your ideology and really say who you hate and who you don't hate out there in the world and then drive that into the general election. And for some reason, in the Republican con uh, convention, it all was Hillary's fault. So, you know, there was, you can I can still hear, like, lock her up, lock her up, lock her up. <coughs> and then this whole thing was the most gaudy personal, pers uh, personal vehicle for Trump and his family. That reads Las Vegas to me. I don't know if it does to you. And then we had the uh, World Wrestling Federation Queens We Are the Champion moment of, you know, uh, entering, the, in entering the convention and quite a portrait of hubris and political celebrity. Uh, if there's a key image to summarize the event in Cleveland, though, and maybe the whole election, it, I think it was this photograph. There was this weird mirror that was on the wall in the convention floor, and I can't tell you how many photographers took full advantage of it to what? Capture this season and this event in terms of the theme of distortion. What's real is surreal. And now to the Democratic Convention. Backlash certainly made itself felt at the DNC as well, much more so, as it turned out, than the RNC. The convention was characterized by extreme tension by more progressive and younger Bernie voters or supporters inside and outside the hall. Many felt gagged and silenced by the system, and which they perceived as tilted toward Clinton and toward the status quo. I'm not sure Bernie's a savior, but his supporters, those seeking a revolution in politics, were perceiving him having been crucified by the party and by the media. And while the Republican convention channeled populist anger at Hillary Clinton, terrorists, and just the other, the Democrats, in this wonderful scene of pluralism, actually, managed to completely appropriate the traditional GOP themes of patriotism and nationalism. If you had told me six months ago that you know, that we'd be hearing the USA, USA chants at the Democratic Convention, I'd be like, you know, no, no, no. And amidst all the tension, of course, there was a milestone that was achieved, uh, a real marker in history, or should we say, herstory. But perhaps no other photo crystallized how much the campaign was uh, uh, turning into a backlash against T Donald Trump, at least from the Democratic point of view, than this scene of the cons. And since the conventions, I threw this in this morning because, you know, two weeks go by and then you've got more, for better or worse. And since the conventions, the higher demand for authenticity has continued to hinder both candidates, as we see in these photos of Trump patronizing African American churches and voters. This is Trump in a highly touted visit to the Great Faith Ministries international and African-American church in, Det in Detroit, and the body language is really telling. Far from connected, there he is in his own little bubble. You know, it's like feeling it, but I'm feeling it, you know, over here. And here, in this expression, in this expression is still another example of the backlash mood uh, and the media not holding back. Like, you know, what are we going to get out of this, and when is it over, and, you know, that kind of thing. This is Trump at the Greater Exodus Baptist Church in Philadelphia with Shaga Hightower, whose daughter, Iofemi Hightower, was killed uh, uh, in a random shooting. She was home from uh, college um, and was hanging out some, uh, with some of her old friends, and this happened in 2007. Once again, the body language says it all. This, this also felt like sort of a Last Supper kind of thing to me also. As for Clinton, besides looking small and anonymous in the crowd, just before the start of the 9-11 memorial ceremony at Ground Zero, this photo documents a painful fact. As she appears to look right at us and we at her, the sense of obscurity compounded by the sunglasses, clearly she, we, she knows she has pneumonia, but we, the public, two days after she learned about it, still do not. Okay, that's all pretty grim. Stepping back, though, from all the contentiousness, there are hard questions to ask about the visual campaign. The largest being, is this tone 
and all this negativity a true and accurate reflection of our nation, or of you and I? Or has the electoral process and our identity itself been skewed by the media, the circus, and by the emphasis on conflict, poli political celebrity, and what sells screen time? This was taken by Mark Peterson last January backstage in the media room at the Clinton-Sanders debate in South Carolina. In one picture, Mark's photo tells us what a good part of the campaign and certainly a, a good slice of the media coverage has been about, and that's static. This photo of a campaign photographer at a Ted Cruz, uh, is a picture of a campaign uh, photographer at a Ted Cruz rally in Las Vegas. And that guy up there is Nate Gowdy, the guy who took the Trump photo of the hyperactivity and also the cocktail lounge. And it raises a couple of questions. Has the coverage put too much focus on the most vocal or the most angry? Has it focused too much on the far right and the far left at the expense of the larger middle? How jaded are we as a result of uh, media bias or media piling on? That's on top of like, how incisive the media has been in terms of exposing a pretty cynical process. And has it too often made people who are looking struggling and feeling disenfranchised look like oddballs or freaks. On our Instagram feed, we, we labeled this the know-it-alls. It's refreshing to see these people as off balance or that they don't know everything. This is an Instagram shot from Getty photographer Spencer Platt taken far from the convention arena during the Republican uh, uh, convention. It points to how much attention the middle class has received in this campaign and virtually none to the poor. This was taken during a protest march down Broad Street in Philadelphia during the first day of the Democratic Convention. It captures the disconnect between the convention drama and the everyday places and issues. Our description on our Instagram feed read, the Philadelphia that was there yesterday and that will be there tomorrow. Also from Instagram, this photo by Hillary Swift for the New York Times. Uh, she's going to be in our um, panel uh, at uh, Photoville on Saturday, if, if you're there, um, with Landon Nordeman, um, a couple more photographers that have been in the slideshow. Uh, admits the unrelenting reports of anger and disaffection in Philly. I like this picture because it's got a little slice of Woodstock to it. I mean, has there been no joy in this whole thing? And, and if there hasn't, like, when do we get it back? At this point, where the media was endlessly reiterating Trump's strengths with blue-collar males, photographer Scott Brower, he'll be on our panel also, uh, was on a cross-country photo tour. He was showing a more complex picture. He actually went out and talked to voters here in Lexington, Nebraska, and photographed them. So in Lexington, Nebraska, he talked to this Air Force vet who says he's never been so worried for the country. He told Scott that he thinks Trump is unstable, but he said I don't tr he really doesn't trust either candidate. Then, documentary photographer Darcy Padilla was shooting the campaign this year for Le Monde, these pictures distributed in France. The photos are less interested in the gotcha and the squabbling than in seeing citizens and understanding the process. Not to be dissuaded by the tattered flag and all the political cynicism this year, here we see good old-fashioned retail politics, a Latina walking a precinct of modest homes in North Las Vegas. So here, this picture, by the way, was taken by a writer for Vox. Uh, so he wrote the story and then snapped the picture. And we see N uh, Nia Harris. She's 24 years old. And she was a concession worker at Wells Fargo Arena um, during the Democratic Convention. And so she was completely exhausted. She had worked an eight-hour shift. It's somewhere, you know, I think around 10 PM. And she'd been, like, wiping off the condiment tables and cleaning the grill and uh, steering lost attendees, att uh, attendees all day long, and she wanted to get home, like probably a lot of you do uh, want to also right now. <laughs> but um, so she starts heading to the exit, and then she sees a bunch of her coworkers, and they're going the other direction. And she's like, like what's going on? So she does a U-turn. She goes back to the entrance to the, ha to the hall, so as close as she could get. And what is going on? Barack Obama is starting to speak. And 
So she's listening, and then she got imbued. She pulled out her cell phone, and she started videoing some of this. And this guy from Vox was watching her, and he asked, you know, what, what are you doing? Got her whole story. And she said, you know, uh, I'm an Islamic American. I've got a small boy at home, and I've been really upset about, you know, this whole, uh, you know, this whole experience, the whole campaign. But I really feel like this is something that can motivate him and make him feel empowered and, and absolutely equal. Um, this is another photo Mark Peterson took during uh, the coverage of the New York primary. Uh, and he was tasked with asking citizens what their number one issue was. So he went up to um, Yaha Safula, uh, posing with his family in Queens, and um, Yaha said, my number one issue is the healing of the racial divide. What's interesting about the photo of this clearly mixed-race couple, you would never know if you're following the campaign that America is like broken down into these completely discrete five categories of white, black, Hispanic, Asian, um, I guess that was four, uh, or just three branches of religion. That's it, all these like strict categories. But in fact, America, and this is like blindly obvious, is complex and more diverse, and where we derive our strength as much as our weaknesses. Partic particularly this photo, whatever you want to use, whatever term you want to use, interracial, biracial, multiracial, multiethnic, interethnic, the complex mis mixing and blending of America has been underway for some time. You do not see it in the campaign or hear about it at all. And, because you guys are all photo students, there's something strange about this photo. Something really strange about this photo. If it was a selfie, Cruz would be at this woman's back, right? If the camera's on, you would see Cruz on the screen. So you get this fascinating bit of symbolism here, actually. We see the media frenzy. The candidate is the rock star. It's all about the show. At the same time, we see the, citi the citizen pointing the camera at the show, and she's seeing herself. Weird, right? But isn't that how it's supposed to be? That the campaign, the electoral process, and that the candidates, far from being the objects of obsession, should always be reflecting us. Finally, going back to Mark Twain and Will Rogers, this is quite a portrait of this backlash election. Given how broken things are, the idea of a citizen stripped naked short of a voting booth reminds us of Depression-era photos of people with nothing to wear but a barrel. Still, what makes it so wonderful is that people continue to claim their right and participate in the process. And there's no stronger demonstration of commitment and health than endurance, and we've all been hanging in there, and also a sense of humor. Thank you very much. This is where you can find us. <laughs> Pick your platform. <laughs> Sign up for our best of email. You'll get a roundup of what we did that previous week. And do you think this is typical of just this situation because of Trump's presence? Or do you think it's deeper than that? Do you think this is a landscape that's changed permanently and for perhaps other reasons, for instance, our, well, this audience's uh, experience in, in decoding, a more sophisticated approach to decoding photographs? Oh. Uh, I'm not a political scientist, but uh, be before you said your last, the, the last sentence, uh, I was thinking that um, Trump, I think, is a symptom of a broken political, you know, uh, institution. So uh, I think it's that skewed because, of, because we're not getting any redress. So, uh, you know, we entered this cycle uh, without any, without any si sign of hope, progress, movement, intelligence, uh, comedy uh, coming out of Washington. And I think that that's what's, the, that these images and the, and the kind of, um, pulling off the band-aid or, you know, just ripping off all the artifice is about. 
and can that change? I think it could change tomorrow. I mean, I, I don't know in terms of, you know, how that happens, but I think that the photographers are basically channeling, you know, that, th that those conditions. So if you were a happier, more positive, optimistic, traditional campaign, the nature of the images would change? Yes, I, I think so. And it's really interesting, you know, if we just contrast, and I didn't show pictures, but it would be re really interesting to look at the visual narrative from, the, from 2008, for example, and especially the representation of youth as opposed to what we're seeing this year. And youth don't hold back. I mean, you know, I'm talking to you. I mean, I'm, I'm a lot older, but, you know, the covering your, your, your mouth with a wrapped up flag um, or, you know, pretending to be hung from a, a cross, um, you know, the, these people really thought that Bernie Sanders, you know, represented something that was fresh and, you know, and had a lot of parallels to what they saw in, in Obama. So, yeah, I think that, I think we could see that again. I, I hope we see it again. And I'm optimistic we're going to see it again. I don't know, I kind of like the revealing aspect of these types of photographs. Of it. it's, it's, really, it's really interesting. I think they really, the photographers, I think, feel like they're channeling our conscience and they are calling bullshit. So, you know, if this thing is a, is a game or a show, uh, they are, th they've been taking every opportunity to, you know, to reveal that. Even if they have to, like, do it through cropping, they're going to do it. Yes? Uh, do you think there's a way that that detachment could, um, like that revealing of that kind of detachment could um, perpetuate it rather than just reveal what's already there as a way to maybe fix it? Uh, like it becomes sort of a, a monster in a way? Like just like well, it starts to take apart? Kind of subsumed in the narrative and uh, not really kind of taken for granted as the norm rather than... You know, that's, that's a really interesting question. I, and I actually gave this um, lecture, a similar lecture at um, Texas A&M a couple weeks ago, and people were asking, has this created a precedent in terms of going forward and now, you know, like laying bare, you know, the, the, the process um, and Maybe, but I have more faith in the, I, I, I think that in fact the photographers are like poets. And, you know, they're picking up, they've got the long antenna and they're picking up, you know, the disaffection in, in all of us. So I, I think that in general, except when they're really profiting from it, which is like a whole other thing to be concerned about, um, but all, in large part too, they're staying really close, I think, to like just revealing how you know, how ridiculous it is or how, you know, specious it is. And I think that they move back and forth by the week. I think that this is a really good example of that because that happened at that week because I, th you know, an editor, th by the way, that's a Getty photo a photograph. And if it was a Reuters, I got to be careful, by the way, too, because this is being uh, live streamed. But, it, but if it was a, let's say if it was a Reuters photograph, I wouldn't have this same level of conviction. But I know a lot of the people at Getty and they're so careful, scrupulous, conservative in a way. And if they decided that that is what we're moving on the wire today, it's because it really was reflective of you know, where we were at that point in time. So uh, yeah, I have more confidence in it. I don't, I don't think it becomes like a, a freight train. I think it stays pretty close to you know, a mirror. Great question. <laughs>